why are window views important? So it's sort of great to touch on this, because I think Lisa mostly set the stage for the question. So we know that we spend a significant amount of time inside buildings. So essentially what window views become is that sort of architectural component which connects us to the outside world, giving us information, dynamic information, such as the time of day and weather, which we won't have access to, for example, in certain types of buildings that are windowless. Because of this connection, we actually find that window views actually convey an array of different benefits, such as health and well-being. We've even seen improvements in cognitive performance and increases in stress recovery rates. Views also that have, for example, high quality, such as those with a view of iconic landmarks or monuments, also tend to be associated with a higher real estate value. So the challenge really that we've seen in window view design is which, which is really how do we design for window views? Because each and every window view is actually unique, which introduces an array of different design criteria. And often what we see within scientific literature, as well as building standards, is actually there's very little consensus in terms of what we need to aim for. So a number of years ago, we raised this question, how can we design for window view quality? And this really became the genesis of a lot of interesting research that followed this. So what we did at the beginning was do a very widespread literature review. So we looked at building standards. So we looked at the SIPC SLL within the UK, the European Normative uh, Daylight in Buildings, as well as North American standards. We also looked at every green certification system we could find in North and South America, uh, Africa, Europe, Asia, and Australasia. And also we looked at scientific peer-reviewed articles in different research domains, ranging all the way from architecture down to visual sciences. And when we consolidated all this information, what we found is that thematically what we could do is really distill these things down into three rudimentary parameters that we believed described overall window view quality. So this is view content, view access, and view clarity. So I'll go into a little bit more details about what these entail in the next couple of slides. Essentially, what you could see here is that actually these really come into the design process at different stages. So we look at view content. It's really early stage design when we're looking at site planning and massing, where we orientate those wielding, uh, windows relative to the out outdoor external landscape. We talk about view access. We're looking at the spatial distribution of the floor plan, where we may put workstations relative to the facade perimeter. For view clarity, we're really looking at the facade materials, so obviously how we control daylight coming in and the resultant view going out. So view content, so this really describes what can be seen within the window view. And amongst different uh, criteria, we found that two prevalent ones that really emerge both within research and building standards is this idea of horizontal stratification and distance. So the horizontal stratification really describes any view which potentially has up to three different unique layers, ranging from the ground, landscape, and sky. And what we say within standards and within research, we infer that views that have all three of these layers tend to be associated with a higher level of view quality. For view content distance, this really refers to how far away that landscape layer is relative to the window. And similarly, if the content distance is further away from the window, we tend to associate a higher level of view quality. The caveat in this, which we've done through research, is we found that this content criterion technically is true, but it really depends on what that content is. So for example, if the content is very desirable, such as nature, it actually doesn't really matter how far away that content is relative to the window. So view access. So view access is a little bit more um, talks about how much can be seen. And there's two ways in which we can describe this and design for it. So the first way is looking really at those opening sizes. So we could do this using the vertical or horizontal uh, viewing angles or the length and height of the window. We can also do this a little bit more comprehensively looking at the window to wall ratio. And what we've done using virtual reality studies whereby we fix the viewing position relative to the window is increase the window to wall ratio for a three layered window view with urban and uh, natural content. And what we found using these studies is that actually at a window to wall ratio of about 25%, this tends to coincide with the minimum level of satisfaction 
to achieve view access. When we increase the window to wall ratio further, up to 65%, what happens is that we reach a saturation point where any further increases in the window to wall ratio doesn't actually produce any noticeable changes in satisfaction. The second way in which we can measure view access is looking at the viewing distance, so how far away the, the person is, or building occupant is, relative to the window. And typically what happens is the further away you get from the window, the smaller the window appears within your visual field of view, despite the fact it's technically the same size, and view access reduces. And again, what we found using VR studies is that around just over two meters, we, are, we hit the saturation point again, where any further increases in distance from the window opening don't lead to any noticeable changes in view access. Interestingly, with this view distance criterion, when we look at green certification systems, this broadly describes the credits that are assigned to uh, window view quality. So view clarity. So view clarity really describes how clear the view appears after shading and any obstructions. So compared to view content and view access, well, view clarity isn't actually as well understood. So what I mean by this is that primarily when we think about shading, um, we use shading, for example, for solar protection to minimize glare and overheating. We also may design shades for visual privacy, renewable energy generation, and rainfall and environmental protection. So what I really like about this illustration in the center here is that you can sort of see that the trees are reflected, uh, are basically reflected onto the glass facade here. And since birds cannot actually see glazing or transparent objects very well, what these external opaque louvers provide is actually a visual barrier for birds for preventing them from actually flying directly into the window. So a lot of these design considerations really look at what's happening on the outside of the building coming in. But what we don't really understand quite well through standards and actually through scientific research is what's happening in the reverse. So when we're inside the building looking out, so how do we design these shades for view retention? The reason why this is important, so when we look at the scale of this challenge, is that even if we're designing for very good view content and very good view access, um, if a majority of the shades are being covered either by shades or blinds, this doesn't really matter anymore. So we're not going to achieve that connection to the outdoors because a lot of these windows will be blocked for most of the time. So what we started to do through research is similar to what we did with overall window view quality. So we started to look at things and describe them in the fundamental properties. So we could do the same thing with view clarity. We're looking at the ob obstruction properties, how the obstruction properties interact with the view content, and also looking at human-centric criteria, such as the observer or the building occupant themselves. So when we look at the obstruction properties, we can describe this in a very simple way by visualizing the exact same window view, but putting a simple obstruction, so we have a horizontal mullion and a vertical mullion on the same window view. Essentially, what you can see in the top left example here is that we place that mullion horizontally. Essentially, what happens, it coincides with those horizontal layers. And what, it, what unfortunately happens in this scenario is that we can potentially block that middle landscape layer because it's at a distance. So the amount of view clarity that's reduced is much higher compared to if we just orientate that 90 degrees. So essentially, in this case, what we're doing is that we're contrasting that mullion against those horizontal layers, and we're avoiding blocking that middle landscape layer, which contains a lot of visual information. We can do the same thing with view content, but this time look at the same obstruction, so that same horizontal mullion, and instead look at its impact on two different views. And what you can see in the bottom image here of this window view is that we're contrasting now that horizontal mullion against features which are primarily vertical, so these vertical high-rise buildings. So the amount of view retention tends to be higher in terms of when we're describing this using view clarity. The last example is really talking about the observer. So earlier on, we learned about myopia. So people that with myopia may not be able to see distant content as well compared to people with normal vision. Also, if they have color blind deficiencies, such as deuteranopia, they may not be able to see certain colors in the same way compared to someone with normal human ocular health. We've also done some subjective studies looking at cultural differences. And actually, what we found across different cultures 
is actually sometimes window view shading preferences tend to be um, personalized depending on the cultural norms and expectations. So sometimes what we see is that visual privacy tends to take priority over things such as daylight access and the view out. So when we look a little bit more in terms of the obstruction properties themselves, what we really did when we looked at various different shading was actually try to categorize them. And we could really broadly categorize them in terms of three main categories, which included fabric shades, solid shades, and glaze solutions. So when we look at fabric shades, we're really looking at those that have little perforations in them, so little holes. So this may exclude certain fabrics I use for privacy or rainfall protection because they tend to be completely opaque. And when we're designing for view clarity, we're really looking at two design parameters. So this openness factor, which describes how big um, those little perforations are, and the fabric color. And the main challenge that we've seen with uh, fabric shades for view clarity is actually with lighter fabrics. So with lighter fabrics, what tends to happen when direct sunlight hits them is that this inter-reflection effect, which basically happens between the warp and the whelp of the fabrics, which basically causes this parasitic luminance effect, which blocks the view clarity going out. We can enhance view clarity simply by changing the color of the fabric shade, by making it darker, which reduces those inter-reflections. But what happens as a, as a sort of a trade-off like in a hot and humid climate, such as in Singapore, where this photo is taken, is that the fabric shade could potentially then become the new heat source because of the albedo effect. When we look at solid shades, there tends to be a much wider variety of shades that could be categorized in terms of this category, ranging from louvers, Venetian blinds, and brie soleil. Really here, when we talk about view clarity, we're looking at the physical occlusion characteristics, such as the shape, the size, the pattern, and maybe also the color as well. And the challenge that we've seen with solid shades and view clarity has really been how these things interact with the view content. So if you go back to the previous slide with a simple mullion, we actually see because of the wide variety of solid shades, they interact with the view differently. So they, they can fracture the view, they can cause these visual camouflaging effects, which makes it very difficult to have an all-inclusive sort of metric that categorizes solid shades in terms of view clarity. For glazing solutions, we looked at things such as chromatic glazing, smart films, and frick glass. Really here, what we were describing is those glazing transmissions properties. And often what we find is actually tinting offers the greatest levels of view clarity compared to other types of shades. The reason for this is actually because if there is a glare source within your field of vision, what the glazing actually does is reduce the overall contrast within the field of view, which enhances the level of clarity. And often what we found, which is quite interesting, is actually when we look at visual sciences, so how we design tinted visors for motorcyclists or even sunglasses, is actually the same characteristics or properties of those uh, films that, that actually reduces uh, the glare source within the field of view and enhances visual clarity. So the mechanisms are very, very similar. But actually a, a challenge that we do find with tinting is that if you go down to really dark tints, it's quite windy, um, what tends to happen is um, inter-reflections can actually be seen uh, onto the glaze solution itself. So this is kind of similar at nighttime when you leave the curtains open and you turn all the electric lights on. The indoors becomes brighter than the outdoors, so essentially what happens is the, the glazing becomes like a mirror, so it prevents you from being able to see out. So lastly, just to talk a little bit more about view clarity in terms of what some of the other challenges are. So often when we characterize view clarity, we often look at the magnitude, so how much view clarity there is. And what we don't understand as well uh, as much is actually how long or the duration of view clarity. So a good way of visualizing this is actually just to take uh, a very extreme but opposing example, which is raising the question, well, if we have a very large but temporary obstruction, is the level of view clarity going to be the same or is it going to be different compared to a small but permanent one? And at the moment, we really don't have answers to this. So we don't really understand what this trade-off between um, magnitude and duration will typically looks like. But why this is important is that actually when we look at the magnitude of view clarity, we talk about low versus high, 
how current standards and metrics, so we have the view clarity index, which is a very good index for quantifying the magnitude of view clarity, but for fabric shades. Uh, under, an undermining assumption of this is actually that those shades need to be fully closed. So we do the assessment when the shades fully obstruct the entire area of the, of the window view. But what we know about fabric shades is actually they, are, um, they provide also a variable level of view clarity. So if they're automated, so they're connected to a closed loop sensor, or they're simply being manually adjusted by building occupants, not always throughout the entire day will that blind be fully shut. So when we contrast this against fixed levels of uh, f items that create fixed levels of view clarity, you can see it on the right. We have like a semi-transparent photovoltaic panel. We have a light shelf just above it, a vertical mullion. What you can hopefully see here on the screen is that there's low E glass on the left, but in the clearer story, there's clear glass. So you can sort of see that there's a slight difference in how you perceive the view out. And a lot of these things collectively create fixed levels of view clarity. And if we really want to have a universal metric, what we need to do is actually harmonize them and add this into variable levels of view clarity. So those caused by shades, for example, such as louvers and Venetian blinds, where they're not static throughout the entire day. So just to wrap things up, so view clarity really is that missing piece of the puzzle for when we're quantifying, trying to quantify overall window view quality. The reason why it is important, just to reiterate, is that it doesn't really matter if we have high view content and high view access. If we're not able to achieve good view clarity, it doesn't matter, it will override the overall design intent. View clarity does largely remain unknown. So another interesting challenge to this is, well, is, is poor view clarity always a bad design? And this is actually not the case. So there's actually some cases where we might design for good daylight access, but we might design for poor privacy purposefully. So for example, bathroom applications, where we need where having good daylighting coming in, but having a view going out is not, is not necessarily a good or bad outcome. In terms of which shade performs the best, well, the evidence does seem to point to films and chromatic glazing, so things that can tint. So it does improve overall uh, view clarity when glare sources are within the field of view, and that motivates shading behaviors. But like all other architectural elements, these things do need to be balanced with other criteria. So while we find that these technologies perform very good for overall view clarity, in terms of other dimensions such as visual, visual privacy, they don't perform as well compared to other types of shading. So with that, thank you very much.